Aloha no kako. This is Kenson again coming to you from the beautiful island of Maui. Well, you can see the topic that's on the screen, Christian Doomsday Preppers. And I thought I'd talk about this because a lot of Christians are wondering, should they be prepping for Doomsday as they see many of their friends perhaps or neighbors doing? I put up this uh, painting right here. I found this on the internet. And, I, and I, I thought it was a kind of an absurd painting because you know right here that it is a uh, redoing of a painting by the great American artist Norman Rockwell that he painted for the Saturday Evening Post, a painting that he entitled Thanksgiving, but they redid it. And instead of a real turkey sitting on this platter, you have this uh, canned turkey that this couple has brought up probably from their large food storage in their basement. And then they've given all their family and guests gas masks, uh, in perhaps in anticipation of the uh, government troops that might be coming to their home with pepper spray or gas bombs so that they can be taken to the uh, FEMA camps. And so even as this picture looks, looks absurd, maybe many Christians think that this phrase right here, the Christian doomsday preppers, is absurd because they believe that this is the preparation, this is all the preparation they need and it is this Psalm 91. Because in this Psalm, the psalmist writes about the protection that God offers uh, the believer. And it is a beautiful Psalm. It's a Psalm that I believe that every person should memorize and, and put in their hearts. Uh, because it is a great a Psalm of assurance that God is with us and that He's watching over us. Let me just read the first two verses. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. And it goes on like that. It's, it's a great, great psalm. Uh, so I'll leave it to you to read the rest. And I'll post uh, below here a link of uh, Just Pearson reading this beautiful psalm. Uh, for you. So you can look at that link as well. But is this, is this enough for the believer to trust God and to trust His Word to protect uh, him or her and their family? Or should the Christian be doing more? I'd like to share with you four uh, simple principles on prepping for the Christian. And the first one is obvious. The first one is this, to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Jeremiah 29:11, a passage that you probably already know, maybe have memorized. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now, it's important to understand the context of this passage in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah was a prophet during the days when King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came down and surrounded Jerusalem and eventually destroyed Jerusalem as well as the temple and took many, many thousands of Israelites back to Babylon to be uh, slaves and servants. And so this passage comes at a very dire time in the life of Israel. And yet, even in this dark time, God promises them that He has a plan for them. And not, not for calamity or destruction, but for their welfare, for their future, and a hope. I want you to uh, also understand that promises in the Bible are not necessarily for everyone. This promise right here, if you, if you look at this word you, it refers to the nation of Israel. This promise is specifically for the nation of Israel. Whether we can apply it to our own lives, perhaps the principle of it, but uh, in, in terms of whether God is making this promise to us, maybe, maybe is uh, debatable. But I remember when my, my wife and I were challenged to go to Papua New Guinea to start this ministry there, the, the thoughts that came into my head was, Papua New Guinea, man, that, that's where they eat people, isn't it? And uh, I was really concerned. I was concerned that we were all going to go, to, go down there and die, basically. And so uh, I was concerned about that. I, I had a weekend to think about it. And the Lord gave me this passage right here in miraculous ways. And he showed me that, Kenson, I have a plan for you and your family, plans for your welfare, not for your destruction, to give you a future and a hope. And I, I took that promise from him that he gave to me, 
and you know we were down there for six years and it was dangerous I'm not gonna downplay that it was it's a very it can be a very dangerous place to be uh, for instance our house had a six foot high fence topped with three strands of barbed wire half inch of uh, bars on every window multiple deadbolts on each door and uh, so you can see that it is there is a lot of security risk down there but you know God kept his promise that he gave to me he kept us safe uh, we, I mean we, we it wasn't all uh, you know hunky dory or or easy uh, we, we came to close to death several times but God took us through those times and I'm still alive and speaking to you right here and same with these Israelites you know God doesn't you know, make our life perfect okay but he what he, he does is he is sovereignly overseeing our lives and so that's what this pro this promise has to do with and so th this promise is for us to trust in him to trust that he has a plan for our life and as we trust him as we follow in his ways we trust him that he is watching over us so that's the first thing that's the first thing you need to do uh, as we enter a very difficult time in, in our nation or in this world to basically trust him because he is in control okay? and then the second thing we need to remember or we can do is flee to safety believe it or not this right here is also a biblical injunction in Luke chapter 21 Jesus is speaking to his disciples right before they go to Gethsemane and he tells them in the upper room he says and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed or encircled with armies then know that the desolation thereof is nigh or in other words Jerusalem is about to be destroyed with its temple then let them which are in Judea the surrounding area flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it or in the middle of Jerusalem depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. So if you're not in Jerusalem, don't go into Jerusalem. If you're in the city, get out. That's what Jesus says. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Okay? So the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD was already foretold. And it was fulfilled as written in God's word. And so Jesus says, there's no um, shame in fleeing, especially when you see the danger is encircling your, your city or your town. And so this is an option too, to flee to safety. If you're in the cities, to get out of the cities. If you're in a country that is being uh, you know, governed by a, an authority that can be abusive and is cracking down on believers, maybe God is calling you to leave your country even as uh, many of these people are quoting of Revelation 18 to come out of her or come out of Babylon or else you share in her sins and so you see many uh, Christian leaders telling their, the Christians to consider leaving um, America and going to another country uh, where the dangers are not as great especially they say in the southern hemisphere because if a nuclear war does occur usually it's going to occur in the northern hemisphere and the nations in the northern hemisphere so that the radiation or the radiation cloud will be heavy in that hemisphere and if you can get below the equator you can get get away from that danger you know, at least so it's there's no shame in fleeing Jesus himself instructs his disciples and the believers after to flee and it is said that in 70 AD when Titus right here encircled the city of Jerusalem uh, the Christians who were in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas remembering this passage and what the Lord said they all escaped and they fled to safety and none of them were killed but the Jews remained behind these walls that they thought were impregnable but you know, over a million Jews died in this siege of the Roman army against Jerusalem and so Again, the second uh, injunction here, flee to safety if you feel God is leading to you to do that and if you have the means to do that. And now another injunction that we have from Scripture is to provide for your own household. We have a lot of talk about storing food and water and other things. Well, it, it's scriptural. 
1 Timothy 5.8 But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or non-believer. Okay? So Paul in 1 Timothy uh, basically encourages us to provide for our household. He says it's our responsibility, especially if you're the uh, father and the husband and the man of the house there, you should provide for your wife and for your kids as this guy right here does for his wife and his six kids. And you can see all these things that they had uh, accumulated and they're storing for that doomsday. Okay, And so this is also scriptural. And uh, so he, to accumulate for yourself provisions. You can see this, especially in the Bible story of Joseph. Remember when Joseph is, is talking to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh had this dream of seven fat cows and seven lean cows, and Joseph is given this uh, discernment that there will be seven good years and then seven bad years, and so he persuades the Pharaoh to store up the grain during the seven good years so that you can live, make it through the seven lean years. And so this idea of storing and preparing for a anticipated difficult time is scriptural. Let's look at the fourth one. This is a controversial one. Arm yourself to protect your household. Okay? Luke chapter 22, they're in the upper room, and this is what Jesus tells his disciples. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, or basically this is your, your bag that you're carrying all your clothes and personal effects. He that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script or his wallet with his money. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Okay. So Jesus is not against a person arming themselves for the purpose of defensive uh, use. So to defend yourself and especially to defend your family, your, your wife, your children. Jesus Jesus is not against that. I, I suppose he might be against you getting arms to run a revolution or to use it in an offensive way against others, but not to defend uh, the life of your family members. And uh, in fact, I think Jesus would say that that is a responsibility of the father, you know, to protect his family and to protect his children. They say that uh, of the firearm, that it is better to have one and not need it than to need one and not have it. And I cannot imagine having to see someone invade your home and attack your wife and to, to try to rape her and rape your daughters and not being able to prevent that. And so the firearm, or as Jesus would say, the sword right here, would be for the purpose of protecting uh, your family. Even as we saw in the previous passage, remember, to provide for our own, especially of our own household. And one of those provisions is protection. Okay. Now, there's a show, there was a show on uh, the cable network Discovery Channel since canceled called American Guns. It followed the lives of the Wyatt family, uh, Rich and uh, Renee Wyatt. They, they uh, actually own a uh, firearms dealer. And they've trained their kids even how to fire uh, weapons. But, you know, we look at this and we say, wow, this is great. You know, we can accumulate these high-powered rifles, etc. So that even if the government forces come, we can defend ourselves. But I think you can forget about that because if the government comes to your home, they're going to come like they did in Boston with overwhelming force and firepower. And there's really no way that you're going to be able to repel them. So forget about that. So you, it is possible to start to get really extreme in our doomsday prepping. And we need to be careful of getting just going crazy with this. Because I want to remind us that our enemy, you know, that our real enemy is not the government. It's, it's not the police or it's not the riot, rioters or the, uh, you know, these people who are lawless running up and down the street should that day come. But it's really the devil, Satan, because he is the one who is pulling the strings and causing chaos. And he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, as John 10.10 10 tells us. And he's the one who is controlling all of these um, circumstances 
that is you know, slowly pushing this world to destruction. And so this, this passage comes to mind, Revelation chapter 12. It's talking about the time of the tribulation. And starting in verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out from heaven, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. You see right there. Let me stop. He's deceiving the world, and that's what we're seeing in our world right now. We see our world close to war, close to and lawlessness in our society. We see our world of the economics where greed has taken over. We can see the uh, just about the monetary systems are about to collapse, etc. And all of these things. Who's behind it all? It's this person right here, the devil, Satan, you know, our deceiver. Are, are the one who lies basically because he deceives the whole world and the people instead of trusting in God instead of believing in him are now believing in these material things and because they have made the material things the things of this world their idols that's what has really messed up everything and people now are are just um, you know they're panicking and they're confused because their gods, these idols, are not fulfilling the, the peace that they want. Okay? And so it says that he has come to deceive the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And that's what makes the tribulation period, especially the day of wrath, the day of the Lord, so bad, is that these demonic spirits, these fallen angels, are going to make the world a very, very dangerous and terrible place to be in. And you can get as many weapons as you can, you can store as much food as you can, you can enforce your home as much as you can, but you will not be able to live through this period. Okay? The, only, the best pre preparation we can do, I call it the ultimate preparation, is verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Okay? Let's go, go through this again. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. We already saw that he is the accuser of our brethren. Okay? He's the one who says, so you're not as righteous as you thought you were. I know what you did and I know what you're thinking and the sin that you have in your heart. Okay? And, and he does that to try to get us down and to try to defeat us and depress us. And what is our, our how do we combat that? By the blood of the Lamb. Okay? He's right. We are sinners. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed his blood and died on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sins. He made atonement, in other words. He paid the penalty, which is death. He died in our place. And when we believe and we trust in His sacrifice for us, that His blood was shed for our sins, when we trust Him for that, God forgives us all of our sins. He forgives us for all of our sins, so that the accusation of the devil now is moot. And it has no power because we know we are forgiven in Christ and because of Him. And it says, by the word of their testimony. What's that word? In Romans 10, 9, Paul, Paul says this. He says that they, and we need to confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. We need to be able to confess that Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, the uh, the Israelites were so afraid of speaking the name of God because of the commandment that says, "Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord, the Lord in vain." That they would not speak the name of the Lord Yahweh. They would instead replace it with another word, the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord. And so, instead of speaking the name of God, they would say Adonai or Lord. And so, when we come to the New Testament. When it refers to Jesus as Lord, it is basically saying that Jesus is Yahweh. We see that in John chapter 1 when it speaks about the Word, that the Word created all things, and everything that was created, nothing was created without Him. 
and the Word became flesh, and of course we know the Word as Jesus the Christ. And so when we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we are saying that Jesus is the Creator of all things. All things in heaven, all things on earth, and all living things, including us. We are proclaiming Him as the Creator God of the universe. And that's, the, that's our testimony. And we need to speak that out loud. We believe that He died for our sins, that He shed His blood for our sins, and we believe that He is the Lord of the universe, the, the God incarnate. We believe that. And when we do believe that, we know that we have the assurance that should we die, that our destiny, our home, will be in heaven. Even as he said, he says, I am going right now, but I am coming back so that where I am, you may be also. He said he was going to prepare a place for us, and basically he was building the new Jerusalem. He has this entire gorgeous city ready for us to inhabit. Each of us has a mansion in that, in that city. Uh, destined or, or reserved for us, the, those of us who believe in Jesus' death and that He is the Lord. Okay? And so that's our destiny, destiny, and that's the ultimate preparation. If you are, have that, you will not be afraid of the worst thing that the devil and the, the, the people that he, are, he is in control of on the earth, what the worst thing they can do to you. What is that? To kill you. Isn't that right? It says, They love not their lives unto death, when you know where your destiny is, where your final destination is, the New Jerusalem, you're not afraid of death. Death is simply the opening of the door. You know, basically if Satan kills us, he's opening this door, we step through into eternity and into the kingdom of God. I, I tell you, it, it's, like a, it's like a trick on him that he thinks he's destroying us and instead he's, he's you know, He's basically moving us from this world into the great world that God has created for us in His kingdom. And so, death is, there is no sting in death anymore. That, that we, we should look forward to death because death is the door through which we enter into God's kingdom. And so, the ultimate refuge will be the kingdom of God. And dying is the way we can enter that. You know, that is, unless the rapture comes. But we should never, ever be afraid of dying. You know? So when, when he picks us up, when the government picks us up and puts us in these camps, perhaps, and imprisons us, we should praise God. Because now we will be surrounded by people, especially the ones who don't believe in Him, who are ready and ripe to hear the gospel. Right now, when, before this time of trial comes, they're not you know, open to hearing the gospel. You know, they have their possessions, they have their homes, they have their cars, they have their fun things to do, they have all of their clothes. And so these are all distractions that keep people from seeing God. But when these people are thrown into prison or into camps, and then now without all of these things, fear sets in. And the believer, if the believer can now be there with them in the camps, in the prisons, the believer has the word that can set people free from that fear. And so if, we're, if we have to go to these prisons, if we have to go to these camps, thank God, because now we can share our faith and we will have a very open and ready audience who will want to hear the message of hope and the message of freedom that is inherent in the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can receive the forgiveness that's in the blood of Christ and they can affirm that Jesus is the Lord so that they will not be afraid of death as well. And so that would be a, the, one of the great ministry opportunities if you remain in a country that, in which this doomsday is taking place. So don't be afraid of doomsday. Don't be afraid of tribulation. Look forward to it because it may be a time of great revival among the people that surround you as you share your faith with them. Amen. Amen. Well, aloha no. Thank you for listening to me. God bless you. And maalama pono. God take care of you. You take care of yourself too. And I'll see you in this city, the city of God, when that day comes. Aloha.